Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. In today's lecture, we're going to be covering chapter 11. So as promised last time, we're doing more on experiments and experimental designs, but this time we're going to be focusing on confounding and obscuring variables. So more problems that we might see in poorly designed research. So for our overview for today, we're going to break the chapter into two big chunks. The first chunk is going to focus on threats to internal validity, so stuff we've already started touching upon but going into more depth. Um, so we want to see if our independent variable was actually responsible for what we're seeing, the difference in our dependent variable. And then after that, once we've figured out what potential threats to internal validity we have, um, what else might be going wrong, then we want to look at interrogating null effects. So what if after all of that work, after all that careful planning, your independent variable didn't actually influence the dependent variable? What do we do then? Um, and that's actually almost the more important part of this chapter because I find that a lot of people don't actually know what to do with null results. So that'll be interesting when we get to that. So we're going to start with our threats to internal validity. So we're asking, does the independent variable really cause the difference that we're, that we're seeing? So first we're going to look at the potential internal validity threats. We already talked about a couple in the last chapter. And then we're going to spend a good chunk of time talking about a bunch of new ones that we should always keep in mind. And then after we talk about all of these potential flaws in experiments, all these potential problems, then we want to talk about why we actually persist with experiments despite all of these potential threats. So that's our outline. And to begin, we're actually going to look at the case of a, or the, really bad example. So the textbook gives us three different setups, three different stories um, of very similarly designed examples that on the surface feel like they might be reasonable experiments, but once we start digging into them and considering some of our internal validity threats, then we're going to start finding some problems. So let's start with example number one, and these are all fictional examples because they're all going to be examples of very bad research, so we can hope they're fictional. So the first is uh, Nick Hill, a summer camp counselor and psychology major, has noticed that his current cabin of 15 boys is an especially rowdy bunch. He's heard a change in diet might help them calm down, so he eliminates the sugary snacks and desserts from their meals for two days. As he expected, the boys are much quieter and calmer by the end of the week after refined sugar has been eliminated from their diets. So for our second example, we have Dr. Yuki has recruited a sample of 40 depressed women, all of whom are interested in receiving psychotherapy to treat their depression. She measures their levels of depression uh, using a standard depression inventory at the start of therapy. For 12 weeks, all the women participate in Dr. Yuki's style of cognitive therapy. At the end of the 12-week session, she measures the women again and finds that, on the whole, their levels of depression have significantly decreased. And now our last example. A dormitory on a university campus has started a Go Green Facebook campaign focused on persuading students to turn out the lights in their rooms when they're not needed. Dorm residents receive emails and messages on Facebook that encourage energy-saving behaviors. At the start of the campaign, the head resident noted how many kilowatt hours the dorm was using by checking the electric meter on the building. At the end of the two-month campaign, the head resident checks the meters again and finds that the usage has dropped. He compares the two measures, pre-test and post-test, and finds that they are significantly different. So, all three of these examples actually fit the same template, which is what we have up on the screen here. So, we have a group of participants. Note that there is always a single group of participants. There is a pretest measure of your dependent variable, 
whether that be rowdy behavior or depression or energy usage. Then we have our treatment. Um, and notice again, because there's only one group, there's only one treatment presented to each. And then we have our post-test measure of that dependent variable. So what we've run into here is almost like a half of a pre-test, post-test design because we only have one group. And so this can be called a one group pre-test, post-test design. And this is sort of a deceptively bad setup because on the surface, we're looking at it and we're saying, okay, well, you're measuring their, um, whatever your measure is, dependent variable before and after a particular treatment. So we should be capturing how their behavior, how that measure changes from before to after. But there is some pretty big problems here. Um, and so we're gonna be going through a bunch of the potential issues that we could run into. Um, and just for an example of what the data from one of these studies might look like, um, here we have our campers um, and their rowdy behavior score at the beginning of the week to the end of the week, and we're seeing this drop off in behavior. Um, and you could run your uh, paired samples t-test um, because we're taking information from one group and looking at their before and after. So you would need a paired samples t-test. Um, but you could compare the differences between groups. And if this is a statistically significant result, then you could do what the example says and wash your hands of it. Say that there's a difference and it's because of the lack of sugar. Um, or the same over here with our pre-therapy and post-therapy um, measures of depression scores. Same thing, nice simple decrease in uh, depression score. But of course we're going to start thinking critically about what else could be going on. And so these are the six potential internal validity threats that seem to be most important to consider for these kinds of one group pre-test, post-test designs. These are the things that we haven't considered with these examples. Um, and so this chapter, we're gonna cover these th six plus an additional six that apply to all sorts of examples. Um, though luckily, we're not gonna do 12 one after another. We can actually do a little bit of hand waving right now because we already talked about three in our last chapter. So back in chapter 10, we spent some time talking about design confounds, uh, selection effects, and order effects. And so those were true then and are still true now as types of um, threats to internal validity that we should be considering for our research, for setting up experiments. So those are included in this group of 12, and because we already went over all of that, I'm not gonna waste your time and do it again. So the count of 12 that the textbook focuses on, we've already cheated a little and done three, so today we only have to learn nine more. Um, but hopefully going through these one at a time, they won't be too, too bad to learn. All right, so let's start at the beginning with our maturation threat. Um, and so a maturation threat is a change in behavior that happens spontaneously over time. So this is some kind of behavioral change, something that's changing your measurements that isn't related to your experiments. So for example, um, children become better at solving um, addition and subtraction type questions as they get older. It's not necessarily going to be relevant for if, if you're giving them math tests to see if they're improving um, in different conditions, if they're improving in a particular classroom setting, you have to take into account the fact that they're going to improve over time anyways, just because of brain development. Um, we can also think about things like trees and, again, children will grow taller with age. So if you're looking at heights, a change in time automatically gives you a change in height regardless of what your experiment is looking at. 
Um, and if we're looking at sort of behavioral stuff for uh, psychological disorders, over time, people actually tend to improve over time in a psychological disorder, even without treatment. Um, so if we think of our uh, depression group here, so people who have depression will naturally go through periods of feeling better and feeling worse. And so over time, people might start feeling less depressed and it might not have anything to do with your therapy. So we have this problem here where in our really bad experiment setup with our one group pre-test, post-test, we have no way of taking into account this natural maturation, this natural recovery from depression. So how can we get around this? And the answer is you turn it into a proper pre-test, post-test design. You use a comparison group. You have at least two different groups. Um, and that's what this graph here shows. So instead of this here, where we just have one line showing the one group before and after therapy, here we could have our experimental group where they received therapy um, and they were tested before and after receiving therapy. But we would also include our no therapy group. So our people who didn't go to, th go to therapy. And so if we just focus on this sort of greenish teal line, people who didn't go to therapy are showing that maturation um, where their depression score is lessening over time, even without treatment. And that, that slope of the line there is really important because it's telling us that there is a maturation threat and we need to take it into account. Um, and if we didn't have this comparison group, if we didn't have a control group, then we wouldn't know how much of the difference that we're seeing in our therapy group is due to just this potential maturation. So we can actually look at these, uh, these two lines here, and because the no therapy group improved, but the therapy group improved more, they have a much steeper slope and they saw a much larger reduction in their depression score, we would be able to still conduct our statistics. We could account for or subtract out this uh, maturation threat effect. And we could still conclude that there was a benefit, there was an improvement in depression scores um, because of this therapy. But you can't do any of that if you don't have this comparison group. And that's going to be a repetitive um, take-home message for a lot of these is you need a comparison group. So we're going to look at a couple of different ways where you also need a comparison group. So our next category of threat is going to be history threats. And these are when some external or historical event affects members of the treatment group at the same time as the treatment. So we're basically saying that there is something else going on in the background that's affecting both, well, I guess affecting the whole group um, at once, and it isn't the thing that you're measuring. So... Um, this isn't something you're manipulating, it isn't something you're measuring, it's some other factor, some third variable that's driving everything that's going on. Um, so a quick and easy example of this is maybe we were looking at in our uh, Go Green campaign. Um, so the green line are the people who were given that Go Green campaign um, so they were getting messages, they were getting reminders, turn your lights off, don't use extra energy, all that sort of stuff. But at the bottom here, we've introduced a little bit more information, and that is, okay, so this campaign occurred between September and November. Well, what else could be going on between September and November? Maybe the change of season. In September, it's still fairly hot, especially if you're somewhere further south than Edmonton. So in September, you'd probably still be using your air conditioning unit if you have one, or maybe a fan 
Um, but even buildings themselves, um, if you don't have an air conditioning, most residences are going to have some kind of cooling system. Um, so your power usage would be high just because of climate control. And then in November, when it gets cooler, you wouldn't really be using your uh, cooling devices. Though here we'd probably switch over to heat, so we might see a flat line. Um, but those are things you have to take into account. And so how do you take it into account? Well, you would have a control group, a comparison group, a group that didn't receive the campaign flyers. And so here, um, if we saw results like this, where both of the groups, the one that got treatment and the one that didn't, um, if they both have the same slope, if they both decrease the same way, then we could probably conclude that there was something else driving this decrease in energy, probably the change in seasons. But if we had something like this, where our uh, two groups show different slopes, show different lines, where our no campaign still shows a decrease in energy usage, but it's not as extreme as the people who received the campaign, then we could say that, yeah, there was some drop-off from season, from some kind of historical or external event, but the campaign still had an effect. And so again, we could run our um, statistical analyses to confirm that this is actually an improvement, even taking into consideration what our um, control group did, but that should show us that there's something still going on. So yet again, a control group allows us to figure out what's happening. Now these historical and external events can take lots of different forms. Things like changing seasons um, kind of makes sense. But um, if we looked at, say, the depression group again, and there was a global pandemic going on, for example, maybe that would be driving depression scores to change in a way contrary to what's going on in the research. So you have to take into account those external factors, and pretty much the best way to do that is to actually use a control group or another kind of comparison group to see if both groups are being affected the same way, and then to pull out some of the specifics of how that's happening. All right, so our next uh, concept is regression threats. Um, and this is an interesting one. So you might have heard the term regression to the mean. Um, and we're also calling it here a regression threat. But this is a statistical concept where we're saying that extreme scores, either extremely high or extremely low, um, they will regress or become less extreme, they will get closer to the average score for the group over time. Um, and so this is a little bit challenging to wrap your head around. Um, but let's, let's look at an example. Um, so because of randomly occurring events, um, maybe the weather happens to be really poor today. Maybe you uh, can't find a parking spot. Maybe you hit a bunch of red lights in traffic. Um, all of that combines together and because of chance events all piling on top of each other, you're in a really, really bad mood today. And you go to an experiment and they score your overall mood. And you're going to score very low, saying you're in a poor mood that day. But the next time you come back to get scored again, you might not have encountered all of those terrible con confluence of events. You might not have had all those problems. So your mood will have improved, not because of any kind of treatment that's going on, but because the random chance that gave you such an extreme score the first time just went away. So you'd go back to normal and score normally. Um, another example would be the textbook talks about um, a particular soccer or European football match where um, one of the teams won the match seven to one. Um, and even for those of us who don't know much about soccer slash football, that's a fairly high score. 
So that would be an extreme score. And so if you were asked how you think that team did on the next game, you'd probably say somewhat less than seven. You'd probably say maybe they got two or three goals, because that seems like a reasonable number for a soccer match. Um, But that is exactly regression to the mean, where we're saying that, yeah, that one event, that one game with seven goals was probably an extreme case, and their usual performance, their average performance, would be much closer to two or three. So we have this built-in understanding of how regression to the mean works. It's just a little bit weird to put it into words. Now, from our description here, um, we can already tell that this is only really a problem if you're using a pre-test, post-test design. Um, and in this case, it could also be a little bit of a problem if you have a properly set up pre-test, post-test design, because it can still affect both of your groups. Um, so you can still use um, a comparison group to see what your baseline is before starting any kind of manipulation. So if you have a proper pre-test, post-test design, you could rely on the fact that an extreme score in one of those two groups is probably just that, uh, an extreme score due to chance. Um, so you could look at your data and figure out that that's probably just something extreme. Um, but if you looked at your data and both your um, control group and your experimental group in the pre-test phase had very similar group averages, then you might be a little bit more confident in ruling out a regression threat. Um, and the other thing you can do is actually look at your data, graph your data, see if there's anything weird going on. Um, and in extreme cases, you might end up um, adjusting your experimental design. So if you run into a situation where you're really, really prone to um, extreme scores at the beginning, then maybe you switch over to a post-test only design for future experiments. Um, I suppose I should show some graphs that actually show this in action though. <laughs> I forgot I had these. Um, but if we wanted to look at a couple of different examples, we're gonna look at one of these graphs at a time instead of um, going over all of them all at once all together. Um, so let's start at the beginning here with A. Um, and so here, if we look at our comparison group and our um, uh, treatment group, or our, I guess in this case, no therapy would be a control group. Um, so we have our bluish line is our control group, and then the orangish line is our therapy or treatment group. And so if we look at their starting data, well, they both had equally extreme measures. So they both scored very high on a depression score. But it would, again, by chance, be very unlikely to have both groups driven by very extreme, very rare, and randomly occurring uh, events. So it's probably not um, due to this regression to the mean because we're seeing the same pattern in both groups where they're both starting really high. So we would look at some other explanation for having very depressed participants. Um, so then our difference here, where they're both um, sort of decreasing a little bit, but your therapy group is decreasing more, we would say that there's probably an effect of the therapy because of the pattern that we're seeing here. So then if we move over to B, in this case, our no therapy group and our therapy group start out with very different beginning scores. And our therapy group starts out higher. That is an immediate red flag for us for regression to the mean. Because our therapy group then decreases over time, but the two groups didn't start at the same point. So because of this difference in the beginning, because their pre-test uh, 
data wasn't similar because our group averages weren't close together, we're going to have some red flags where we don't necessarily trust the data that's come out of this. So there's probably something going on here where there was some extreme value that pushed the results the way they are. Um, and if you wanted to figure out what exact value was doing that, you could do a scatter plot of your data. Look at all of the participant scores um, and see if you had maybe one individual with a very, very high score that's driving this kind of visual. And now for graph number, graph number C, oh dear. For graph C, um, we have another weird case. And so right off the bat, we see that our therapy group starts higher than our no therapy group. So immediate red flags, but here we don't have just sort of this um, slowly drifting down towards the group average. Here we see a very extreme reversal where our therapy group suddenly scores very, very low. If this was just regression to the mean, we would expect this orange line to stop somewhere near the green line, kind of like what we saw up here. But this uh, push to a more negative score or to a decreased depression score tells us that there's probably something else going on. Um, we're not saying that there isn't any regression to the mean, but that there is something in addition to that because you wouldn't see this extreme of a difference um, just from regression to the mean alone. All right, so our next topic. Uh, our next type of threat is the attrition threats. Um, and so an attrition threat is basically going to happen when you have a reduction in participant numbers from pre-test to post-test. And this one's kind of interesting because we have to keep in mind that it has to be a systematic attrition, um, carrying over some of the same concepts from last chapter. Um, so we run into a specific case where just through doing research, if you do any kind of study that requires people to come back in, you're almost always going to have a much smaller number of people who come in for the second test. <laughs> so for your pre-test, maybe you have 100 people. But for your post-test, maybe some people got bored, maybe they moved, maybe they stopped caring. Um, and so they didn't come back. So your post-test sample might only have 90 people. So all of a sudden, you have far fewer people, but only in your post-test data. Um, and so this is especially problematic if we happen to lose people at one of the extremes of your data set. So here in graph A, if we lose these two people in blue, if these two people don't come back, then our group mean drops from 5.7 to 4.3, not because of anything that happened in between these two times, in between our pre and post test, but just because we lost our highest scoring individuals. So this is just a matter of statistics and the data that we lost and not actually showing any difference in those means. Um, it's a little bit more tolerable if you happen to lose people from, say, the middle of your data, or if you lose a bunch of people randomly distributed through your um, data here. So if you lose someone on the higher end, but you also lose someone on the lower end, and maybe a couple in the middle, then it's not going to shift your mean quite as much um, and so here, even though we still lost two people, our mean has only changed by 0 0.06. So that might be tolerable. Um, so you can look at these things and kind of uh, figure out where the people that you lost came from and sort of what scores you've lost and make sure that you haven't just lost all of your high scoring individuals. But another way that you can do this, and probably the better way to do this, is that you remove the people who have uh, left, who have gone through attrition, remove their data completely. 
So if you're doing a study and you have 100 people at the beginning and 90 people at the end, you should run your statistics only on the 90 people that completed both testings. That's probably the best way to do it. Um, Sometimes that's not always the case. Sometimes researchers can't justify losing extra data, but you have to make that critical decision after looking at um, sort of who you've lost and who. All right, so next we have testing threats to internal validity. Um, and a testing threat is going to be a type of order effect in which there is a change in participants as a result of experiencing that dependent variable, whatever you're testing them on, more than once. So we talked about order effects last time in the last chapter. So this is just a special case of order effects. Um, and so we're caring about the fact that if you have a pretest and a post test, that people might improve in their ability to do the test. Um, if you are giving them a challenging logic puzzle and you want to see how they do before and after some kind of treatment, well, maybe they don't know how to approach the problem the first time, so they struggle more. Um, and then the second time they get the same kind of question, they know how to start answering it because they've seen it before. Um, so you have changed your participant because their ability to do the task has adjusted. Um, and this doesn't always have to be an improvement. This could also be um, sort of a decline. So we can have a decrease in scores due to fatigue, which we already mentioned all this time talking about order effects. Um, but yet again, if we want to get around this, there are a couple of ways. One of the easiest and best ways is to include that comparison group to make this a proper experiment and compare it to something. So we can have our comparison group again in orange and treatment group in teal. And here we're seeing that both groups score better the second time around. So that improvement is probably due to a testing effect. Um, but we do see that our treatment group improves more than the comparison group. So if we can take into account that testing effect, then we could still say that there was an improvement um, between the treatment group and the comparison group, even when we have removed the effect of that uh, testing effect. Another way that we can do this is to not use the same test before and after. Um, so if you were doing, say, a depression score, Maybe the first time you do it, you want to use one particular type of uh, Likert scale um, for measuring depression. And then as your post-test, maybe you want to measure something else. Maybe you want to use um, different neurotransmitter levels, get a physiological measure. As long as both are valid measures of depression and are comparable, then you could use two different types of scores and rule out testing threats. Um, another way would be to not use a pretest if your particular method of measurement has the potential to permanently change your participants. Then maybe you want to use a pretest or a post-test only design. Um, so our example of teaching kids to ride a bike. Maybe you only want to test their bike learning ability or bike riding ability after they've learned because testing it beforehand gives them extra experience that could throw off your data. Um, so there's quite a few ways around this option. So next we have our instrumentation threat um, or instrumentation decay. And this is a little bit of a weird one that happens when your measuring instrument changes over time. Um, so in this case, maybe the people who are doing the measurements of your behavioral data, maybe your scorers adjust. Um, if we think about the campers who were not given sugar, maybe after a whole week of being around these campers, maybe the counselor just got used to them being rowdy and didn't view their behavior as rowdy anymore 
just because they habituated to it. So in this case, the behavior didn't necessarily change. Our measurement changed. So this can cause lots of problems. Um, so again, the biggest problem happens when the difference happens between your pre-test and post-test measurement. So we can get around this by using a post-test only design. So if you have a problem getting from pre-test to post-test, then maybe don't design it to have both. Um, if you have to use a pre-test, post-test design, then maybe you should take extra steps to make sure that your pre-test and post-test measurements are equivalent. Make sure that it hasn't changed. Um, maybe have some kind of external factor measuring things to make sure that everything's standardized. Um, or if you're using a behavioral uh, scoring, then maybe have the, have the behavior scored all together at the end. So videotape the behaviors for the pretest and the post-test, and then score them all together, all at once, all mixed up, um, so that your uh, observers don't change anything in between them. <clears throat> now, if, if you're sort of thinking about this, our instrumentation and what we just talked about, our testing threats, seem on the surface to be rather similar. Um, but if we think about sort of what we're talking about having changed, that's how we can differentiate between the two. So for the instrumentation effect, it's the measuring instrument itself that changes between your pretest and post-test. But for our testing threats, it's actually the participant themselves that have changed. So either they've improved in ability or they've um, reduced their ability due to fatigue, but the participant is the thing that changes for those testing threats. So if you focus on um, what exactly is causing this difference, whether it's the instrument or the participant themselves, that helps you piece apart whether it's instrumentation or testing threats. All right, so that was actually six threats if you've counted them, and the textbook threw in a couple of bonus ones, which are really just combinations of those six types of threats. Um, so just to let you know that it, you don't only see one of those threats at a time, you might see compounded or combined threats from that list. Um, so you might have two different types of threats to internal validity, and they might make everything worse by compounding the threat. Um, so one of the common ones you might see is a selection history threat. Um, so selection coming from how we choose our participants, and history, meaning how the environment is affecting them, how external factors are affecting them. So we might run into a special case where an outside event or factor, that history part, is systematically affecting participants in one particular group, in one particular level of that independent variable. So maybe in our depression study, um, maybe the group that was receiving treatment has seen uh, an advertisement that tells them that treatment for depression just makes it worse. So they are all systematically sort of set against their treatment of going to therapy, um, but it doesn't actually affect the other group. So we have this systematic effect, and it's an outside event that's affecting only one group of participants. Um, for our selection attrition threat, maybe only one experimental group experiences attrition. So again, with our depression example, maybe the extra effort of having to go to therapy maybe once a week or twice a week is becoming too much for people who are already feeling depressed. And so we could have attrition only in our therapy group, but our no therapy group all of them stick around because there's no extra effort involved in not going to therapy. Um, so both of these are causing problems and they're affecting only one group, which obviously could have a big uh, effect on our results. So 
reasons to keep those in mind and critically evaluate what's going on. So now that I have hopefully convinced you of the importance of including a comparison group, I want to keep going on for additional threats to internal validity, but these are ones that apply to any kind of study, even those that have been properly set up and actually have a comparison group. Um, so the first of these is observer bias. And so this happens uh, when the researchers' expectations influence how they interpret the results of the experiment. So using our three experiments from the beginning, um, maybe Dr. Yuki, who was looking at patients with depression, um, maybe she assumes that the patients who are in treatment are going to improve, and that expectation is going to color or bias her interpretations of the results. Um, this is especially important if you're using some kind of behavioral measure. Um, particularly anything open to interpretation. And it's always good to point out that observer biases aren't necessarily something that's intentional. They're not trying to mess with their data results. It's just sort of this innate, built-in, um, I expect it to work this way, so I'm going to interpret things that are ambiguous to support what I'm expecting. Um, for our counselor, uh, Nickel, who was um, trying to wean his campers off of sugar in hopes of improving their behavior, he might actually just imbue their post-test behavior more positively because he assumes that having no sugar in their diet was working. Um, and so even though you could have a comparison group um, a control group with no treatment, and that can help with some of our problems, if there's some kind of bias in the person who's observing or making the measurements, then it's going to affect both groups. So even if you had a no therapy comparison group for our depression study, then our doctor might still interpret that group as having less improvement because that's what she expects to have happened. So that's what happens when the observer's expectations are affecting their own interpretations. Now we can talk about um, demand characteristics. And this is when the participants sort of figure out what's going on in a research study and actually change their behavior to match the expectations of the researchers. So if our campers figured out that their counselor changed out their sweet food for no sweet food, and that he's been monitoring their behavior, they might figure out that he's hoping to see a decrease in energetic behavior. Um, and so they might comply and change their behavior to match that expectation. Um, so to go around this, we have a couple of different methods. So one of the best ways you can do this is by using a double blind study. And so for a double blind study, we're talking about the researcher, the observer, doesn't know if, uh, doesn't know which group the participant is in. So they don't know if you're in the experimental group or the control group. But the second side of that is that the participant doesn't know who is in the treatment group and who is in the control group. So it's double blind because neither side of the experiment knows what's going on. Um, sometimes it really isn't feasible to conduct a full double blind study. Um, so sometimes you'll see a mask design, masked, M-A-S-K-E-D, um, or a blind design. Sometimes I've seen them called single blinds. Um, and in those cases, the participants don't know what group they're in. Um, or sorry, the participants know what group they're in, but the observers don't. Um, and so the idea here is that if you can prevent the observer, the person doing the measuring, from knowing what's going on, that you can try and keep them from influencing your participants and 
Also, I guess as a side effect, you get to reduce your observer bias as well. Um, but if we think back to last chapter and we had the students who were taking notes and they were either in the handwritten note condition or the laptop written note condition, you can't really hide what kind of notes they took from the participants. That's not feasible. You can't not have them know that they took handwritten notes. Um, but you could have the, the scores um, for their questions um, not linked back to what group they were in so that your scorers, your researchers and observers didn't know what group the participants were. Um, and then for our last one, placebo effects. This one's kind of cool um, and actually gets its own series of slides because it just needs them. So the placebo effect is when people receive a treatment and improve, but only because they believe that they're receiving a valid or effective treatment. Um, so you've probably heard about uh, taking a placebo or having a placebo um, usually tied in with, say, taking a sugar pill or um, sort of not being given a proper treatment. And that's exactly what's going on here. So with a placebo effect, um, sometimes if you give one of your groups, if you give your control group a sugar pill, or a saline injection, something that hides or masks, whether they're in a treatment or a control group, you still might see an improvement in their scores just because they think that they're getting some kind of treatment. So if you're studying the effect, you're studying the effect of antidepressants on scores of depression, your control group wouldn't necessarily be taking antidepressants because you're trying to control for the effect of those antidepressants. So if your experimental group is taking a pill with those antidepressants, then your control group should also take a pill so that they don't know that they're not receiving treatment, but that pill shouldn't have any kind of influencing factors, which is why they call it a sugar pill, because usually it doesn't contain anything other than sugar or some other kind of innocuous substance. Um, so you're keeping your uh, participants in the dark about what group they're in because you don't want to influence their behavior. Um, but the placebo effect shows us that they still might change their behavior because they believe they're receiving a valid or effective treatment. So in this case, you're going to have to set up your experiment to account for the fact that people are possibly going to improve from pre-test to post-test scores simply because they think that they're being treated. Um, so you can set everything up to do this, um, and we can actually look at a couple of graphs over here. So um, our placebo therapy is the orange line here. So that's our control group, but specifically a control group that was given a placebo so that they don't know that they're part of the control group. Um, and then our greenish line, our teal line, is our true therapy group. So that is our treatment group. Um, and so for pretest, they both start at the same place which tells us that we're, in a, we're looking at some good data to begin with. Um, and then we see this splitting off where our placebo group still improved. Um, their symptoms decreased. Maybe their scores on a depression scale decreased. Um, but that's not actually due to any kind of drug because they didn't receive a drug. But what we care about is the fact that our true therapy group improved more than the placebo therapy group. So if we take into account the fact that both groups think that they're receiving valid and helpful therapy, so both of them have some kind of placebo effect going on, um, but our placebo group, that placebo effect is the only thing that's driving this change. So the difference between the two groups must be because of the effect of whatever drug they're taking. Um, and that's how we can interpret our results by looking at this.
Um, now this is sort of our special case of a double blind procedure. If you set it up properly, um, where uh, you don't want your researchers, your observers, to know what group people are in. And you don't want the people to know what group they're in, which is why you're giving them a placebo to begin with. So you can specify that this is a uh, double blind placebo group or a double blind placebo design. Um, now, if we wanted to do our due diligence and really make sure that what's going on here is actually just placebo effect and isn't some other thing, some other factor that's going on, because we talked about some other uh, threats to internal validity. Um, what if there's something like maturation or history or regression or testing or instrumentation threats? What if any of those are involved here? How can we taste for that too? And so the other thing that we can do is actually include a third group that doesn't get any therapy at all, meaning they don't even get sugar pills. So we can then pull out the um, effect of the placebo effect um, in addition to all the other stuff that we could be looking at. So if we look at our lines here, even our no therapy group, who has nothing else theoretically going on, showed a slight improvement over time. And that just might be because with things like um, depression, there might be an improvement in scores over time just because time has passed. So that's what's accounting for this change between the two points in time. And then the difference between our no therapy group and the placebo therapy group, that could be explained by our placebo effect. And then the difference between the placebo group and the true therapy group, that can be uh, explained away by our actual drug effects. Um, and if you're wondering how much of an effect can the placebo effect have? And the answer is tons. Um, in one of the studies early on that was looking at, um, again, depression drugs, I believe they were looking at Prozac or one of those families of drugs. Um, and they ran this exact kind of a setup and they found that about 75% of the improvement, even in the true therapy group, could be explained away by placebo effects. So their placebo group had a massive improvement in their uh, symptoms and the, uh, the difference between their placebo group and their true therapy group wasn't that large. And so about 70% of the difference from your start and your end time was due to just placebo effects. Um, and this is why it's something to consider and that's something that you should definitely keep in mind when running an experiment that might include this kind of an effect. All right, so those are our 12 threats to internal validity, plus a couple of combined threats to, to round it out. Um, but this table from the textbook, table 11.1, .1, actually goes over all 12 of our types of internal threats to validity. It gives us the actual definition, it gives us some examples, and it gives us some of the critical questions that we should ask about each type of threat to internal validity. So I'm not going to go through all of them because we just went through all of them, um, but this is a fantastic resource to be studying from. Um, but so if we look at uh, order effects, so for repeated measure designs, this is when the effect of the independent variable is confounded with a carryover from one level to the other. Or because you've improved due to practice, or you have reduced performance due to fatigue or boredom. So something to do with um, sort of having one exposure, then the next, then the next. Um, and so we can have our example of chocolate ratings um and maybe it's uh you're gonna see that people always like the first one that they taste better than the second one um no matter what order they receive them in. and so the first one um that order always sort of seems to do better and so things that you want to ask are 
did the researchers counterbalance the order of presentation of the levels of independent variables? So you could look and see, okay, in our methods, did the researchers set it up so that even though it's a repeated measures experiment, the participants were divided into two groups where they experienced the order of exposure differently. So they're still getting exposed to all levels of our independent variable, but they're going to be exposed in different orders. Um, and you can also take a look at some of the statistics because a really good experiment would take into account whether there were actually differences in performance because of that order. So I've run experiments before where we um, expose uh, individuals to a sound first, and then we expose them to a different sound second, and then you have your counterbalancing where you do the opposite, and then you would run a quick test to see if the groups performed differently overall um, when they only differ on the order of presentation. Um, and if you end up doing something like that and there's no difference between the groups, statistically it means you can then condense your data back into a single group. Um, but it gets really complicated if you do find order effects and you have to take those into account statistically. Um, but that's just a experience from the field in more detail than what the textbook covers. Um, so you can go through all of these, all 12 of our different types of threats to internal validity and specifically focus on things that you should be asking to critically evaluate that particular threat. And as we click through all of these, it kind of stacks up the number of different problems that we can run into, like 12 different threats and each of these potentially being very serious. It kind of leads us to that point of, okay, well, if there are so many threats, why do we still conduct experiments? Why don't we stick to correlations? Why don't we do some other kind of research? And the answers depend. Um, the, the first idea is that a lot of the threats that we're talking about are only really a problem when you don't have a comparison group. So six of our 12 could be pretty easily ruled out by just having a well set up experiment that has comparison groups and looking at your data properly. Um, and a lot of the other things can also be controlled by setting up your experiment properly. So once you're aware of these potential flaws, you can design an experiment to mitigate or eliminate these threats. Um, another thing to consider is that some of these problems, especially these ones, here, well, not so much the placebo effect, but um, our observer bias and demand characteristics this must sound kind of familiar because that's something that can also apply to correlational studies. Um, so we can have problems consistently across all kinds of research. And so the purpose of knowing these things and taking a course like this is to understand our limitations and know how to adjust things to account for it. All right, so that gets us through what can go wrong and how to think about it and how can we control for all of these potential internal validity problems. And now we can move into the second part of the lecture, which is where we start looking at null effects or null results. Um, I have always called it null results, um, but the textbook seems to prefer null effect, so we'll see what the terminology comes out with as I'm talking about it, but if either, uh, either term is talking about the same thing. So what happens if you get through all of this, you've designed an experiment that you think is well designed, everything's all set up properly, you get to the end, you run your statistics, you do your t-test, and your p-value is high. It is higher than 0 0.05. And so you're concluding that uh, the independent variable didn't actually affect the dependent variable. There's no significant correlation or correlation or covariance between our independent and dependent variables. There's no difference between our group means. So what now? What do we do with that? 
And like I said at the very beginning, null results are kind of rare and not often talked about. A lot of researchers, if you end up getting null results in a lab, someone will be upset because their study didn't work. And that's not necessarily the case. So we can look at graphs like this, um, which are showing that our group means are very, very close together. And again, I have my small pet peeve that they are lacking some error bars. So we could draw in some error bars just arbitrarily. We could say this one had less variation, so a smaller error bar. But if we have complete overlap between our error bars, if our means are really close together, this would be a non-significant result. Um, and in this case, again, the textbook has given us some examples that we could um, consider some of the other possibilities if we get results like this. So I'm going to do the same thing I did earlier on where I read out the three examples from the textbook so that we can discuss some details about what else could be going on to give us those null results. So the first example uh, that we can look at actually goes along with this graph here. And so we have uh, the many people believe that having more money will make you happy, but will it? A researcher designed an experiment in which he randomly assigned people to three groups. He gave one group nothing, he gave the second group a little money, and he gave the third group a lot of money. The next day, he asked each group to report their happiness on a mood scale. The group who received cash, either little or a lot, was not significantly happier or in a better mood than the group who received nothing. So... They were all about the same on a score of happiness. For our second example, we're asking the question, do online reading games make kids better readers? An educational psychologist recruited a sample of five-year-olds, all of whom did not yet know how to read. She randomly assigned the children to two groups. One group played with a commercially available online reading game for one week, um, the other group continued treatment as usual, meaning they attended their normal kindergarten classes. Afterward, the children were tested on their reading ability. The reading games group scores were a little higher than those of the kindergartners uh, or kindergarten as usual group, but the difference was not statistically significant. So that would be this graph here, where we have this average versus this average. And again, when they don't give you error bars, um, you might look at that and say, yeah, maybe there is a difference. But if they specify not statistically significant, we're probably looking at something like this, um, where the error bars are just giving us some information about the variability in our data, the amount of noise or error. Um, so the more error or noise in your data, the larger your error bars might appear. Um, and having done behavioral research on animals, you can have error bars that are ridiculously large, um, and it makes it very difficult to find results that way. But we'll come back to variability in data. First, we have to talk about our third example, which I don't have a graph for, but the textbook does. But you can imagine what it looks like, all the bars the same. So, researchers have hypothesized that feeling anxious can cause people to reason less carefully and logically. To test this hypothesis, a research team randomly assigned people to three groups, low, medium, and high anxiety. After a few minutes of being exposed to the anxiety manipulation, the participants solved problems requiring logic rather than emotional reasoning. Although the researchers had predicted the anxious people would do worse on the problems, um, participants in all three groups scored about the same. So no significant difference between groups. So if we can have those basic setups in mind, we can use those examples and maybe some explanations for what's going on to critically evaluate our null results going on. All right, so we have three different uh, perhaps explanations 
So perhaps there isn't enough uh, between groups difference. So maybe there isn't enough difference between the group meets. Perhaps the within groups variability obscured the group differences. So perhaps there's too much noise in our data. And the third being perhaps there really is no difference. Maybe this is a true null result and there is no difference between the groups. And then at the end, we're also going to talk about the rarity of null results. Um, and the fact that they're not so much hard to find when doing research, because in practicality, it's fairly common to get a null result, um, but it's actually hard to find null results in published form. And we'll come back to that at the end. So if we want to focus on perhaps there is not enough between groups difference, there are a number of explanations for this. Um, so we can run into weak manipulations. So sometimes there just isn't enough of a difference between the groups. Maybe our independent variable manipulations weren't enough to see a difference. So if we think about um, the study of money on mood, if we think about this guy here, what if our no cash scenario is zero dollars and some cash is 25 cents and a lot of cash is a dollar? Well, that's not really enough money to affect people's mood and the difference between none, 25 cents and a dollar is all kind of the same. So that's a fairly weak manipulation because we're not creating distinctive groups to compare. Um, we can run into insensitive measures. So sometimes your null result happens because the researchers really haven't operationalized your dependent variable with enough sensitivity. So if we're looking at the kids who were doing um, reading programs versus just going to kindergarten, if there's an improvement because of the reading programs of two points on some arbitrary scale of reading performance, but the researchers are using a pass-fail measure, then that two-point improvement doesn't matter because it's not visible on the pass-fail measurement. So if your measurements are too broad and insensitive to small changes, then you can run into problems there as well. So next we're going to talk about ceiling and floor effects. So these guys actually get their own slide. Um, and so ceiling effect happens when the participant scores on your dependent variable are all clustered at the high end. So you have something like this where um, with our reading, uh, reading example, so reading games are pink, control games are blue. Um, and in this case, um, this is slightly different because it's not just students who are doing kindergarten. This is people who are playing games unrelated to reading. Um, I don't know why they switched it up for this figure, but there you go. Um, but in this case, if the questions that you're asking are very easy, if they ask you to read, um, uh, if they're five years old, they're just learning to read, but you give them a picture book that's just colors and words that go with the colors, then maybe kids can figure it out even without reading. If the word red is on a page with only red items, the kid might figure out that the word is red. Um, and so if the questions are very easy to answer, then pretty much everyone's going to be able to answer the questions and everyone's going to score very high. So there's no way to tell the difference between the two groups because even the group that should be doing worse is doing as best as possible. They're getting pretty much 100% on their score. Um, for floor effects, this is the exact opposite. So the participant scores on your dependent variable are clustered at the low end. So they're going to score very low no matter what. Um, and so here, we're saying that the questions are too hard, where even the kids that have started to learn how to read are going to perform poorly because the questions are really hard. And even being able to read doesn't help them on them. Um, so you can see either of these. And again, you could look at your data to pick this apart. 
Um, and if we just plotted, say, a scatter plot of our data, or um, heck, we could go all the way back to doing, um, uh, remember our distributions when we had our normal curves? Um, if we did normal curves, or I guess in this case, abnormal curves, we would see our data is skewed to one end or the other. So this here would be showing a ceiling effect where we are um, biased with higher scores where everybody's scoring really, really high. Everyone did really, really well. And this would be our zero. And this would be our sort of max score. So everybody got almost 100% on the test. So our data looks like this. Um, and you can have the opposite of that where everybody clusters towards the zero because nobody scored. Um, so those are our ceiling and floor effects. Um, I suppose uh, if you wanted to get around this, you could pick a better uh, independent variable or dependent variable, depending on which one is actually causing the problem. Um, so if we wanted to talk about uh, specifically our independent variable being the problem, we can just look at our example of money and mood, where they were only given very low amounts of money, zero, 25 cents, or a dollar, that would be a floor effect caused by our independent variable being very low scores. They didn't spread out. Um, for the dependent variable, that's kind of what we've talked about here, where the thing that you are measuring is causing the problems. And you can have experiments with problems on either side, or in a really bad situation, you could have both. <laughs> um, so those are ceiling and floor effects. All right, so we did weak manipulations. We did insensitive measures, ceiling and floor effects. Okay, so now we can start talking about manipulation checks to try and detect these three things. Um, and then we can talk about a weird case of design confounds being funny. Um, so we've already mentioned manipulation checks, but here we can talk about specifically making use of them to help us um, pick apart what might be causing a null result. So our manipulation checks include a second dependent variable that's involved in a study or included in a study where we make sure that our independent variable manipulation worked. Um, so if we use our anxiety study as an example here, um, so we have people who were supposed to be in a low, medium, and high anxiety group. Um, depending on how we made them feel anxious, that might not have worked. So for this graph here, what if your low anxiety group has been told that they're going to get a 5 volt shock? Medium anxiety, you tell them they're going to get a 15 volt shock. And high anxiety, you tell them they're going to get a 45 volt shock. Um, and then after you've told them this, you can ask them on a scale of 1 to 10, how anxious are you? Well, anybody being told they're being shocked is probably going to feel fairly anxious. And you might not know the difference between a 5 volt shock and a 15 volt shock. So everybody is showing high anxiety. So in this case, our manipulation check is telling us that our low, medium, and high anxiety groups don't actually differ on anxiety. So we would need to re-rig our experiment to use a different kind of manipulation because this one clearly isn't working. Whereas if we saw something like this, where our low anxiety group scores low on anxiety and high scores high on anxiety, then that would tell us that our manipulation worked and we can proceed as normal. And so our last consideration for this not enough between groups difference is our um, design confounds. And now we've talked about design confounds as being problems with internal validity. Um, so we talked about them in that framework, but a design confound can also apply to null effects or null results specifically if they're acting in a manner that counteracts the true effect of the independent variable. Um, 
So basically, if you were looking at a graph, if your true effect of your independent variable would be a positive uh, difference, and the design confound is causing a negative difference between groups, then they would level out somewhere in the middle, you kind of average everything together, and you end up with your two groups looking fairly the same because you have two conflicting um, forces on your data. So for example, um, in a GRE study, um, which is a test, a standardized test that you sometimes have to take to get into certain schools, um, specifically for grad school, you might take the GRE. Um, so if we look at two groups, one group that is told they're going to be taking the GRE and that they need to do well on this to get into school, um, then they're going to be getting test prep to prepare for the test because they know it's coming, but they're also going to be feeling the added pressure of, I need to do well on this test. Whereas if you have a no test prep group, if you have a group that just shows up and writes the GRE, then they don't get the test preparation, but they also don't have the negatives associated with having stressed about having to write this test. So there's no pressure. So you might have um, sort of less of a difference because there was this confound, this design confound that was um, affecting the two groups in different ways. So you always want to keep in mind what else might be pressing on your results, maybe something you haven't considered in terms of your design. All right, we're in the home stretch here. We can look at um, maybe our within groups variability obscured the group differences. So we can say that another cause of these null effects could be that there was too much within group variability. Maybe there was too much noise or error or unsystematic variance in our data. So having too much noise in your data can actually make it very difficult to tell the difference between your two groups. Um, so we can talk about things like measurement error, individual differences and situational noise, things that are going to create noise and variability in your data, um, and how sort of each of these can have an effect. And then when we get to the end, we can talk about the fact that um, having extra noise is basically a problem with power. So we'll start with measurement error. And measurement error is any factor that can inflate or deflate a person's true score on your dependent variable. So if we're measuring something like height, a person who's being measured for their height might be measured as a little bit higher or a little bit lower than their true height just because of the person who's use, using the uh, meter stick, the person who's doing the measuring. So a uh, measurement error is any kind of variability around that true measurement. So if we want to get around measurement error, you can try and do so by using reliable, precise measurements. So make sure that you have, have a very good measurement tool. Um, take a look at your uh, internal uh, inter-rater and test-retest values. Um, you want to make sure that it's a valid measurement. You want to make sure there's good construct validity. So you want to make sure you're using the best kind of measurement possible and that you're using it properly and that you're taking all those extra steps to make sure that it's consistent or as consistent as you can make it. Now, sometimes you're doing the best you can and you can't be more precise than you already are. And sometimes the best way to continue then is to use more measurements. So measure more instances, get more participants, get more um, things to include in this, uh, in this study. So if you're measuring height and there's a little bit of variability and in 10 people, that small amount of variability is gonna cause a lot of noise, maybe measure 100 people. And then that noise isn't as problemsome or troublesome 
in these larger groups, those random errors, that noise in your measurement, will start to cancel each other out as you have more people in that sample. We can also have individual group differences. So people vary. You have differences in behaviors. Some people are faster runners, some people are smarter, some are funnier, some are more depressed or um, anything, any kind of variable that you're gonna be measuring. People have very uh, different things due to just them being individuals. It's one of the problems of working with individuals is that they vary. So if we look at um, some individual pieces of data from that uh, no money versus one dollar, we're removing our middle group because it's irrelevant here, um, and looking at their mood, well, maybe Michael is a happier person. Maybe he's in a good mood and that's just, that's just who he is. Whereas Candace, even though she's in this group, is not as happy of a person. So what we're measuring here isn't because of the difference in how much money they received, but just their personal individual differences. So individual differences spread out your data, create more variability or more noise. So if you want to get rid of individual differences, maybe you can change up the design of your study. So maybe use a within groups design instead of an independent groups design. So something like this. So test the same people when they have no money versus when they have some extra money. And because you're using them twice, you can kind of control for or hold constant those individual differences. So by changing your design, you are less susceptible to individual differences. Um, sometimes it's not possible to do a repeated measures design like this, or um, your, uh, your within groups design. Sometimes you have to make do with a between groups design. And so maybe you just have to add more participants. Again, if you're having problems with noise in your data, sometimes the best thing you can do is add more participants, get a larger sample size to try and counteract some of the random noise. So again, by having more participants, your hope is that the random variation gets canceled out and you can get a more true value of your um, group averages. And then another kind of noise is situation noise. So this is what happens when you have external distractions of any kind that's going to obscure between group differences and cause variability within your groups. Um, so maybe you're conducting the experiment in the cafeteria and there's lots of stuff going on. There's different sights and sounds and smells and stuff that can be creating noise in your data. So to get around this, you can more tightly control your environment. This is one of the benefits of experiments is you can put people into very controlled settings. So bring them into the lab. Don't have external distractors. Don't have other smells or sounds or anything going on. Um, and by controlling for that, you can reduce some of this situational noise. And so now all of these points are kind of getting at the same concept. So all three solutions to those problems are basically ways of increasing your power. And we've already talked about power as the likelihood that a study will yield a statistically significant result when that independent variable really has an effect. So can we find a difference between groups when there is a difference between groups to find? So studies with lots of power are going to be more likely to detect true, dri true differences. So you're more likely to find a difference between groups when there is a difference to find if your experiment is set up in such a way as to have high power. Um, and things like lots of noise in your data can reduce our power. So you don't want to have a lot of variability or you want to take steps to mitigate or counteract that variability. 
potentially just by having larger sample sizes, or by setting up a better experiment to help improve your power and make you more confident in your results. And so now we have another summary slide. So this is all of the types of obscuring factors we've talked about, problems with variable manipulation, um, insensitivity in your measurements, ceiling and floor effects, all of these things. Um, and again, examples and questions to consider when critically evaluating a null result of an experiment. Um, and so again, we, we just went through all of these. So this table is a good reference, but I'm not going to go through it all, all over again because we just did this. Um, and you've listened to me prattle on enough. So if we got through all of these potential obscuring factors, if you did your due diligence running, a, uh, running an experiment, you got to the end, you got your null results, and you checked, you're sure that it wasn't an ineffective manipulation. You're sure that it wasn't um, an insensitive measure. You're sure it's not ceiling or floor effects. All of these things, you made sure that they're all not a problem. Then you might have gotten to the point where, yeah, you actually have an independent variable that has no effect on the dependent variable. That's very possible. Maybe um, there is no difference in uh, how much money you have and how happy you are. Um, there are all sorts of studies that have been done that have true null results. And that's okay. If you can be sure that you've taken into account all of these other things, maybe you've run some follow-up studies to make sure that you're sure, um, then you can also say that, yeah, this independent variable actually doesn't affect our dependent variable. There's no effect here. Um, it is a real null result. The problem is that you don't really see null results very often. So one of the major problems here is that null results are published a lot less often. There's a little bit of publishing bias where it's actually very difficult to get a null result published in a scientific journal. So if you go to a journal and say, I did this study and I got a null result, you might get turned away. Um, you can improve your odds if you can show that you have done sort of the best setup experiment and you've accounted for all of the other possibilities and you've done your due diligence and everything is perfect and there's still no result, but some journals still won't take it. So that's a publication bias. Um, and that's because even though scientific journals aren't as, um, affected by the popular uh, interpretation as media, other kinds of media, um, they still want to publish interesting facts. They want to publish interesting studies. And in a lot of cases, null results aren't that exciting. So they tend to be published less. And even in popular media, you're almost never going to see there's no effect between X and Y. Um, the one caveat to this for null results is that if there has already been a paper published that had a result, so maybe somebody was studying the association between um, depression levels and uh, the TV shows you watch, and they said that a certain genre is really, really bad for your depression. If you run a follow-up study, if you try and replicate those results, and you aren't able to replicate those results, if you get a null result after following the same steps and doing a good study, you can publish your result as sort of a counterpoint to an existing study that had a positive result. It's a little bit easier to do it after that, but it's very hard to publish a null result on its own. Um, and that's one of those problems with um, publications and the current method of publishing science, and we really don't have a fantastic way around it. Um, some journals are getting better at it, and like I said, if you as the researcher can sort of show all of your work and make sure that you've made it clear that you did everything you could to be sure this is a null result, then you have better chances. But it is still going to be harder, and you're usually going to end up publishing in a much less prestigious journal 
just because of not having a significant result, which is tough to, to face as a researcher. Um, but it's also good to keep in mind for why you don't see null results more often, and that's because we can't really do anything with them as scientists. So on that slightly sad turn of, uh, uh, of effect, let's leave it here for today, and we will pick up next time with chapter 12.